So the VO2 max is not actually a measure of how fast you are at a given distance or a given pace. Really, it's a measure of how much oxygen your body can utilize. Given your heart's ability to pump blood, your blood's ability to carry that oxygen, and your muscle's ability to utilize that oxygen, um, you get a resultant VO2 max number, which is usually scaled by kilograms of body weight, or you can give it in absolute terms. For cyclists, absolute may be more important. For sports like running, the scaled version is more important. The cool thing, though, is that there are a lot of tools that exist, such as uh, Coach Jack Daniels' VDOT calculators and his tables that uh, correlate a what they call a V dot score, which is a derivative of the VO2 max, with various training paces and estimated uh, personal bests across a variety of distances. So, for instance, it, let's say that I had a VO2 max of 50. Well, I could look that up on the VO2 max tables, and it would give me an expected time that I would be able to run if I was training for specific events. Let's say the mile or the 10K or the marathon. Let's talk to Dr. Brandon Sawyer, who is actually one of my colleagues here at PLNU and has done a a lot of research regarding VO2 max testing. So we're just gonna pop over to his office. He has to put up with all of my lecture recording because we share a wall. Uh, Dr. Sawyer, can you tell us a little bit about your background with VO2 max testing? Yeah, for sure. So starting with my uh, my master's degree at uh, I, I I did at University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Um, I worked with a couple of uh, experts in, in VO2 max testing, um, Dr. Glenn Gazer and uh, Dr. Art Weltman, and uh, and yeah, did some studies with them early on and uh, trying to understand the physiology of it as well as the physiology of uh, critical power or critical velocity, which would be kind of maximal sustainable intensity. So kind of in those areas. And then since then, uh, since I've been at Point Loma, I've done quite a bit of work on trying to just refine testing methodology for VO2 max to be able to really identify when somebody reaches a true max and when they don't. Can you tell us a little bit about the verification phase? Yeah, absolutely. So so really the, the original definition of a VO2 max was when somebody increases intensity of, of the work of the of the exercise they're doing, but their oxygen consumption does not increase. Um, so, for example, somebody's running on a treadmill six miles per hour. We a lot of common protocol we use would be go up one percent per minute. Um, let's say they get to 10 10 percent grade. They're going six miles per hour. Their VO2 is at let's say 50. Um, we we take them up to 11 percent, and their VO2 stays at 50. We know that their body actually requires more oxygen to be consumed to to exercise at that higher intensity. But if it doesn't actually increase, then we call that the VO2 plateau. And so that, that's kind of the initial criteria that, that was observed in, in research was an increase in intensity with no increase in oxygen uptake. And so that's kind of what's known as a primary criteria for VO2 max. So meaning that if we see that, then yeah, we know that's their true VO2 max. But the problem is we don't, we don't always see that. We don't see it very often. Um, so what people did was come up with secondary criteria, which pretty much means we look at their blood lactate levels at max, we look at their respiratory exchange ratio, which is their CO2 divided by their O2, um, or we can look at their perceived exertion, um, we can look at their maximal heart rate. So kind of trying to find some numbers that might be threshold values for all right, if, they, if they achieved a certain number with all of those, then that means they reached a true max. Problem is those are also very problematic. They don't, uh, sometimes people achieve those much before they reach max. Sometimes people reach a plateau in VO2, but they don't achieve any of those things. So it's kind of all over the place there. So kind of our third option, which is what we're, what we're uh, really moving towards now is the verification phase, which is kind of a way to artificially create a VO2 plateau. So pretty much we, if we go back to that same example, we've got, <clears throat> got that person to six miles per hour and 11% on the treadmill. Let's say their VO2 is 50 what we would do would be let them um, kind of cool down, do an active cool down for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we put them back on the treadmill at about 10% greater of a work rate. So that may be uh, maybe 6.3 miles per hour and maybe 12% grade, get them up about 10% higher. And then if their VO2 still doesn't go over that 50, it still plateaus, then we know for sure that, yeah, that is the maximum amount of oxygen that they can take in. And that's another key part to VO2 max testing too, is choosing the correct um, increment because uh, part of, part of a, a, what's, what's shown to be a good VO2 max test is that fatigue happens 
at a time in between eight and 12 minutes. Um, and that's a really key part to designing a protocol to a VO2 max test. If you have somebody that goes 25 minutes, um, they might just stop because of more general fatigue, not because of true oxygen limitation, right? If you design a protocol that only lasts four or five minutes, then they, their, their, their oxygen uptake just might not have enough time to get all the way up to max. And so the ideal range is right, right in that eight to 12 minute uh, range. And so what we, what we do typically is we actually, um, will actually uh, predict their VO2 max with some algorithms that, that have shown to be pretty good. Um, they're just based on their height and their age and their weight and their sex and their physical activity level. Um, and then we'll design a protocol to get them to that predicted max right at 10 minutes. So really VO2 max is known as the gold standard measurement for cardio respiratory fitness is what it's called, right? So like the fitness level of your cardiovascular system, your respiratory system. Um, and it's a, it's a great marker for cardiovascular health as well. And so, so if you, if you took a bunch of measurements like percent body fat, body weight, um, even cholesterol, even blood cholesterol, blood pressure, things like that. And then you also did a, a VO2 max on somebody and you use those to predict cardiovascular health over the next 10 to 20 years, the best predictor of their health would be VO2 max by far, um, much better than any of those. Um, so it's a very good marker of cardiometabolic health. And then again, back to the fitness, um, it is just kind of the gold standard measurement of fitness. Um, and so, so getting that, what's also known as aerobic capacity, VO2 max, um, it's just a really good test of your cardiovascular system, your respiratory system, your skeletal muscles, your, your metabolic health of your skeletal muscle. And so that's kind of one of the things that I love about VO2 max and why I love studying it is because in order to really think about VO2 max, you have to think about everything involved in getting oxygen out of the air, into your lungs, put it onto your red blood cell, pump it out of your heart, send it to your, send it through your arteries, down to your capillaries, extract it out, and then actually use it in your muscle cells. So anything along the way, it could be a potential limiter of VO2 max. And so in a lot of ways, it really looks at a at, at, at whole body function. Um, and so, yeah, it's a great marker of metabolic health, cardio health, uh, respiratory health, all of those things. Awesome. All right, thanks, Dr. Sawyer. Yeah. Nice work, nice work. Nice. Nice work. Dr. Good is here back.